In 2007, Kim, as he was known to his friends, was dancing atop a wall during a concert at the harbor in Victoria, British Columbia, when he slipped and fell to his death. He was 72 years old, and during his life he had been a social worker, earned a degree in economics from the University of Berlin and another in literature from the University of British Columbia, and studied to be a librarian. He was a husband and father. He was politically and socially active. He would eventually be profiled in the New York Times and the Globe and Mail, and even make it into Encyclopedia Britannica's 1969 yearbook. In the late 60s, while living in Vancouver, B.C., Kim made a decision. He stopped trying to be a librarian. Instead of the normal quiet life he had been working towards, he decided to devote his time to mocking the four pillars of society. Money, status, respectability, and conformity while spreading joy and confusion to anyone who would watch and listen. This quickly put him at loggerheads with the mayor of Vancouver at the time, Tom Campbell. Campbell wasn't a particularly warm man. He seemed stodgy and stiff, almost the perfect poster boy for the establishment that the counterculture of the late 60s was fighting against, the perfect target for Kim's particular brand of ire. Kim would show up at City Hall, dancing and capering in the halls. He tried to get Mary Campbell to wear a funny hat during one council meeting before being thrown out. And he showed up at a school board meeting to declare that education was a waste of time and they should lock all the school doors forever. It wasn't long before the mayor and council were tired of Kim and his antics. While the youth and disenfranchised of the city loved him, the city fathers certainly did not. Fortunately, the Canada Council for the Arts saw value in what Kim was doing. Fittingly, on April 1st, 1968, they granted him $3,500 for what they called a serious contribution to the self-awareness of the entire community. Which, of course, made all the squares in City Hall livid. In their eyes, Kim didn't work. What he did wasn't art, and it was taking money from those who had made a genuine contribution to society and deserved the money for their pensions. Kim bought a donkey cart and drove it around the streets of Vancouver, stopping and parking wherever it pleased him to do so. Rush Hour would find him blocking up an intersection as he tended to the donkeys before moving on for a few yards and then stopping again. Sometimes he would go to City Hall and park on the lawn, and famously, when he was brought before the judge for disturbing the peace with his donkey, the judge said, Sir, your donkey is polluting my city. Kim replied, Sir, your city is polluting my donkey. It didn't matter to Kim, though. For the next two years, he continued to wander the streets of Vancouver, promoting his message by staging dance parties and buying the city's homeless musical instruments for a happening in Vancouver's Pigeon Park. You see, Joachim Foykes was a fool. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Throughout the medieval and renaissance period, it was common practice for noblemen, kings, and queens to enjoy the services of a jester or fool. They both served the same role at court, to entertain, amuse, or distract their employer. Same role, two different names. And as you may recall from our bard episode long ago, there was another kind of jester as well, which roamed the countryside entertaining the commoners. But as we've already dealt with them, let's focus on the court jester. Well, to be honest, while we can say we're just going to deal with a court jester, right out of the gate we have to mention that a whole bunch of other names also apply to the same role. Because the origin of jester is in the old Anglo-Norman form of gestur or gistur, which in themselves referred to other similar terms like foal for fool, buffoon, and bourdeur, which all had different skills like storytelling, juggling, magic tricks, and the telling of jokes but also shared similar roles as comedic performers. It's complicated, but the distinction here is that the court jester was engaged more or less permanently by someone of noble stock to perform for them at court regardless of their particular skill set. We have a tendency to think of jesters as being part of the royal court of various European monarchs during the medieval and renaissance period. 
You know the type. He comes out with his floppy, multi-pointed hat with little bells on it. He has a stick called a bobble, which has a likeness of himself on the end with a pointed hat and bells all its own. There's a baggy suit of multicolored clothing and a pair of shoes with more floppy points and bells. The overall impression is of a hot air balloon that crashed into Santa's sleigh. And while that image is often accurate, we'd be remiss if we didn't point out some significant differences. To begin with, jesters were around entertaining various Egyptian pharaohs as far back as ancient Egypt, as well as the emperors of ancient Rome, not just the European courts of the Renaissance and medieval times. In fact, Almost every civilization which produced some sort of royalty had some sort of jester to go with it. China, India, Japan, Russia, Africa, even the Americas had jesters at court performing for royalty. China wins, though, at least when it comes to having jesters the longest and having the most well-documented jesters. They had names like Twisty Pole, Baldy Chun Yu, Moving Bucket, and Newly Polished Mirror. It wasn't until the Yuan Dynasty and an improvement in Chinese drama and the rise of the stage actor through the Chinese opera in the 13th century that the fashion for jesters began to fade out. By the 17th century, Chinese jesters had all but disappeared. In Europe, though, jesters kept cropping up well into the 19th century. Thanks to having a well-to-do upper class, the European jester could still be found in some stately homes and manors at least as late as the 1830s. Later still was the jester in the Persian court of Shah Nasseruddin. In the late 1800s, you could still find Karim Shirai at work in the court. When the Shah asked him if there was a shortage of food in the kingdom, Karim is reported to have said, Yes, I see your majesty is eating only five times a day. Not all jesters were male, either. Lucretia the Tumbler, Jane Fool, and Nicola were all well known in their time. Lucretia and Jane were both jesters in the court of Mary I of England at the same time, with Jane having served previously under Catherine Parr and Anne Boleyn, wives of Henry VIII. Nicola was with Mary, Queen of Scots, where she was just one of a number of jesters, both male and female. Nicola appeared to be particularly favored, though, having received several gowns and cloth and no small sum of money from Mary herself. While there is no record of what sort of jester she was, She appears to have been good enough to end up in some of the finest courts of Europe, including that of Catherine de' Medici in France. To say a jester was employed is, at least in Europe, a little disingenuous. Certainly the majority were well cared for and well regarded, receiving a stipend or even a salary for their services. But often as not, they were treated as property and bought and sold at a whim or given as gifts to other noblemen. As for where they were acquired from originally, it varies. In Russia, they were often selected from among the older and uglier servants of the house, with the expectation that a particularly old one would be extremely droll in their humor. Meanwhile, in England, Queen Elizabeth I acquired the famous jester Tarleton when one of Robert Earl of Leicester's servants spotted a boy working his father's swine. Apparently pleased with what he called the boy's happy, unhappy answers, the servant brought him to court and he immediately entered the Queen's service. If you were on the run for a variety of reasons, say you had a fondness for collecting other people's livestock as your own, you might be fortunate enough to get out of all the hot water by taking up gesturing with a local emperor, as did 13th century French jester Robert Le Diable. King Moncut of Siam, of the King and I fame, had a dwarf jester which was found by one of the king's half-brothers on a hunting trip. He was taken to Bangkok, trained as an athlete and gymnast, and then presented to the king. Many jesters came to court as curiosities, those with defects of birth, both physical and mental, or those who suffered from various growth-stunting maladies were often taken in to become court jesters. It seems harsh, but parents often willingly gave up or brought to court themselves sons and daughters who were incapable, for whatever reason, of being a help around the home or taking on some other useful job in the community. It was a hardship for a family to try to support a child that could never support itself properly and required someone else to tend to them, perhaps for the rest of their lives. Essentially, that meant two people in the family were now unable to help. In hard times, it could mean the difference between survival and starvation. Far better to let them go to someone who could support them and had the staff to look after them than to risk the well-being of the family. 
Oftentimes it was either that or deal with the child yourself. This may have been the case with Jane Fool, who, it was noted, was under the care of Lucretia the Tumbler. Some scholars believe Jane may have had a strong learning disability. Of course, we all know that the key thing about being a jester, its one clear advantage, as it were, was being able to speak truth to power without fear of reprisal. Which is true up to a point. That point being when you say exactly the wrong thing to exactly the wrong person at exactly the wrong time. After that, all bets are off. While it was possible to deliver bad news that no one else dared if you were a jester, such as by delivering the news of a French naval defeat at the hands of the British, by telling Philippe the Sixth that the English sailors don't even have the guts to jump in the water like our brave French, it was also possible to step way out of line, as in the case of Triboulet, court jester to both Louis XII and Francis I of France. The story goes that Triboulet could not keep himself from slapping the king on the backside. Naturally, the king lost his temper and threatened to execute him. After calming down a bit, the king promised not to execute him if he could come up with an apology that was more insulting than the deed. Triboulet thought for a moment and then said, I'm sorry, your majesty. I didn't know it was you. I thought you were the queen. Later, under Francis I, Triboulet would again postpone his imminent execution at the hands of the king when, after insulting the queen and her courtiers again after being told not to, upon being allowed to choose the manner of his death, he requested old age. Funny enough that Francis merely banished him from the realm instead. Still, it is accurate to say that jesters could speak to the king or queen in ways other members of the court could not. As long as they couched whatever they were saying in a humorous, pithy, or witty manner, the truth could be told and the monarch in question would accept it. Especially since the jester was in no position to avail himself of more power by misleading the king or speaking falsely. The jester just entertained. He didn't hold office or have any authority other than what the king had given him. It made the jester unique in a court of people who otherwise might be seeking to climb the ladder. As Beatrice K. Otto notes in her book, Fools Are Everywhere, the Court Jester Around the World, we have seen numerous examples of a jester advising or correcting his monarch, and the recorded instances are particularly abundant in China. Chinese records give us an idea of just how effective a jester could be in tempering the ruler's excesses. For the occasions when his words of warning were either ignored or punished, are heavily outnumbered by those when he was heeded and even rewarded. It is in the nature of jesters to speak their minds when the mood takes them, regardless of the consequences. They are neither calculating nor circumspect, and this may account for the foolishness often ascribed to them. Jesters are also generally of inferior social and political status and are rarely in a position, and rarely inclined, to pose a power threat. They have little to gain by caution and little to lose by candor, apart from liberty, livelihood, and occasionally even life, which hardly seems to have been a deterrent. They are peripheral to the game of politics, and this can reassure a king that their words are unlikely to be geared to their own advancement. Jesters are not noted for flattery or fawning. The ruler can be isolated from his courtiers and ministers, who might conspire against him. The jester, too, can be an isolated and peripheral figure somehow detached from the intrigues of the court, and this enables him to act as a kind of confidant. The life of a jester was not all fun and laughs, though. While many jesters would eventually retire in office and some were banished from court for one liberty too many, others went on to have more adventure than they might have wished. Take the case of Sir Geoffrey Hudson. Born in 1619, he was the court dwarf to English Queen Henrietta Maria of France. Reportedly, he was very small, about 18 inches tall, yet properly proportioned. In 1626, he was presented to the Duchess of Buckingham and joined her household. When the Duke and Duchess entertained King Charles I a few months later, a pie containing Hudson was placed before Queen Henrietta. He arose from it fully dressed in a tiny suit of armor, and the Queen was so delighted that Hudson joined the Queen's retinue and became a member of the household from then on. There, he joined up with another member of the household, himself a curiosity, the giant Welsh porter William Evans. Evans would pull Hudson from his pocket along with a loaf of bread, and the tiny Hudson would proceed to make a sandwich. 
Eventually, Jeffrey would go on to become both witty and courtly and distinguish himself for other things besides his size. When Hudson was 10 years old, he, along with other members of court, went to France to secure a midwife for the Queen's first pregnancy. On the return trip, the ship was captured by Dunkirk pirates. The pirates plundered the ship but released the crew and the court returned to England. Ten years later, at age 20, Hudson found himself on the rest of the royal house on the verge of the English Civil War. The Queen took Hudson with her to the Netherlands, where she attempted to raise money and support, failed, returned to England, and found the country at war. In what he considered to be a great honor, the Queen appointed him a captain of horse. In 1643, the Queen fled the country to France, as the war showed no sign of ending, and again took Geoffrey with her. Which is where things start going very wrong. At some point, Hudson decides he's tired of being the butt of jokes into curiosity. Naturally, shortly thereafter, someone insults him, and Hudson challenges the offender to a duel. Unfortunately, the offender doesn't take things seriously, and arrives at the duel with a 1640s equivalent of a squirt gun, full of water, which we're sure was very helpful when Hudson fatally shot him in the head with an actual gun containing, surprise, real bullets. Since the man Jeffrey has just killed is the brother of William Crofts, head of the Queen's lifeguard and master of horse, some offense was taken, and Jeffrey Hudson is sentenced to death. Also, France had outlawed dueling by then, and were none too happy themselves. Fortunately, Queen Henrietta intercedes on his behalf, and the sentence is reduced to exile. He leaves France and heads back to England. As it turns out, though, it might have been kinder to allow him to be executed instead, though no one was to know that just yet. See, in 1644, little Geoffrey Hudson is aboard ship when it is captured by Barbary pirates, so named because they came from the Barbary coast of North Africa, you know, where some barbarians came from. See last week's episode. He spends the next 25 years as a slave of the pirates laboring away, and, um being used in other ways. And it isn't until the 1660s that he's heard from again, possibly ransomed and rescued by one of several missions sent from England. He never re-enters royal service again and spends the rest of his life in poverty and eventually in prison for the crime of being Catholic, thanks to Titus Oates and his fake popish plot, which we simply haven't got time to go into. Hudson is finally released in 1860, but dies two years later, reasons unknown, buried in an unmarked pauper's grave. By and large, though, it is the Restoration itself which brings about the end of the English tradition of jesters. Charles II never bothers to start it up again, and instead goes to the theater where he mostly patronizes the work of Thomas Killigrew, English dramatist and theater manager, who isn't really a jester, but manages to do many of the same things as one. So much so that Samuel Pepys describes Killigrew as the king's jester in his diaries. But we digress. The tradition of the jester is long gone, by and large. Today, a similar function is taken up by performers and writers on the stage and on our screens. Satirical plays and movies, stand-up comedians, even cleverly written TV, when and where it can be found, are more than happy to hold the mirror up not just to those in power, but to society as a whole. Of course, half the trick is getting the right people to pay attention and listen, which is never an easy thing, even when you were just playing for the queen. But at least we don't need jesters to do it anymore. Although... There are jesters still being appointed today. However, they are mostly the other type of jester, the traveling public entertainment type that we said we wouldn't talk about in this episode since we already did them in Bard. In North Wales, they appointed clown, juggler, and entertainer Russell Irwood as the official jester of Conwy in 2015, and two people have been appointed heritage jester of England since 2004. But let's wind up with the story of the King of Tonga and his royally appointed jester, Jesse Bogdanoff. In 1997, things were very troublesome in Hong Kong, and many of its citizens were looking for a way out and a place to go ahead of the British handover. 
Inter Tonga, more than happy to sell passports to those looking for a way out. To the tune of $20,000 a pop. Even Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos thought that was a good deal, and joined 5,000 other people in buying one. Now, Tonga was not a wealthy country, so those sales represented the bulk of their economy. Fortunately, in 1994, Bank of America sent out one Jesse Bogdanoff to be Tonga's financial investment advisor. By careful investment in the 90s stock market, he made Tonga a further $10 million, all very exciting. And in 1999, when Jeffrey asked King Tupau IV if he couldn't be made official court jester of Tonga, his birthday is April 1st, you see, which makes perfect sense, the king said yes. In exchange, Jesse said he'd promote Tonga as a tourist destination, write the king a poem, and play saxophone at all royal events. Meanwhile, all that lovely money Tonga had made with investment and passport selling, 26 million of it, was moved from the Tonga Trust Fund into speculative investments, which then all promptly disappeared in 2001, leaving just $2 million to be recovered and a lengthy series of lawsuits and countersuits to deal with. You'll never guess who most Tongans blamed for it, and no one is laughing. Joachim Foikas, Kim to his friends, had a favorite nursery rhyme he liked to quote to politicians and interviewers. You'll probably recognize it. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. This has been GM Word of the Week. Thanks for listening. The show continues to survive thanks to the most gracious support of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to join them, or just pick up the feed for your favorite podcatcher, or even get in touch with the show, head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com and check out all the links in our menu there. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Today's music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions and Epidemic Sound. An unemployed jester is nobody's fool. <laughs>